this case presentation and session. Uh, my name's uh, Arjun Sebastian. I'm a orthopedic spine surgeon here at Mayo Clinic. Um, and I'm joined today uh, by uh, one of my colleagues and friends, um, Dr. Nasser, who's also an orthopedic surgeon here at Mayo Clinic. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, degenerative myelopathy cases of the thoracic spine. Uh, and so we'll lead it off with a few uh, case presentations and, and go from there. And hopefully this will spark some good discussion. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the first case. Okay, here we go. So the first case um, is uh, one of my partners, Dr. Courier. Uh, this is a 58-year-old gentleman who presented with progressive lower extremity weakness. Uh, he had worsening low back pain and lower extremity uh, weakness over several months that had been treated sort of conservatively with gabapentin as an outpatient. Unfortunately, over a three-week period, he had progressive increase in these symptoms and difficulty walking during due to weakness and clumsiness. Uh, and uh, he also, in addition to this, reported some back pain and some new urinary retention, but no frank incontinence. Um, he has, you know, like a lot of our patients here, a host of, of medical comorbidities, including obesity, heart disease, um, and, and kidney disease. And on exam, he was found to have weakness, most notably in the right lower extremity, with kind of two out of five strength in all of his muscle groups. He had brisk reflexes in his lower extremities and clonus and really decreased sensation from a T11 uh, level down. Uh, he did have a normal rectal exam. Uh, subsequent workup uh, included initially um, some imaging obtained at outside facility with an MRI scan of the cervical and lumbar spine. Uh, you can see on these images, he does have some you know, mild degenerative changes, but no severe stenosis. Uh, when he was evaluated here, uh, we did obtain some further imaging of the thoracic spine. Uh, and this does demonstrate a fairly um, large disc herniation at the T10-11 level. And if we go to the uh, axial T2-weighted cuts, you can see here that it's causing um, a fairly significant amount of mass effect to the right side uh, and fairly severe spinal cord compression. Um, a CT scan was also obtained in this case, uh, and it was not noted to be a significant amount of calcification. Um, and you can see some of the uh, osteophytes that have formed at um, the uh, T11, 12, sorry, the T10, uh, 11, 11 level. The plan uh, for surgery um, was to do a right sided transpedicular decompression uh, with uh, uh, non structural uh, inner body fusion utilizing local bone graft uh, and a posterior fusion along with that. Uh, and so I think this case is kind of interesting. You can see here that uh, they did take the superior aspect of the pedicle uh, on that right side to get the disc herniation, um, but we're actually able to uh, place a screw into the lower aspect of the pedicle uh, and keep this as a sort of a single level construct. Um, and these are some post-operative CT images, again, showing uh, the instrumentation, the facetectomy on that right side, uh, and the uh, post-operative decompression infusion. So I think, you know, this, this article, at least for me, was a nice review of, of the transpedicular technique. And, you know, I think one of the highlight papers uh, that describes this technique was a paper by Dr. Bilski uh, in New York, uh, where he described his experience treating uh, 20 consecutive patients that presented with herniated, herniated thoracic discs, 14 of those who presented with myelopathy and six with uh, radiculopathy, who he decompressed through a transpedicular approach. Um, you know, prior to this, he discusses in his introduction that, you know, any manipulation of the cord is associated, obviously, with um, significant risk of neurologic injury. And here you can see fairly good results with this technique. So in, in this uh, series, uh, 13 out of the 14 patients with myelopathy regained ambulatory and uh, bladder function. Uh, and even the patients with the radiculopathies also noted improvement. Uh, while they did have one patient with transient neurologic weakening, uh, worsening, really fairly minimal uh, complications uh, with this technique and, and really no postoperative instability. 
Uh, and I think this is a great uh, depiction of the technique. Uh, and, and I'm gonna jump ahead to one of the pictures kind of showing again, uh, that resection of the facet on the ipsilateral side, uh, taking down that superior aspect of the pedicle so that you can get flush with the disc space. Uh, and then the important part is kind of using down pushing curettes uh, and um, uh, uh, drills to sort of push the disc material uh, and the disc herniation kind of down and away from the cord to exact a safety compression. Um, so with that, that's kind of our first case. Um, you know, I guess I would uh, start off by um, uh, bringing Dr. Nasser in and asking him, you know, in his experience, you know, would, would he have approached the case any differently? Um, do you think fusion is necessary in this setting? Um, I'd just be interested to get your thoughts. Uh, it's, a, it's a great case. And obviously one of our partners, uh, Brad Courier, who's a, an excellent surgeon did that. And obviously you can see the attention to detail. I think in my hands, I probably would have consented him for one additional level of fusion only because sometimes it's hard to still have bilateral fixation after you've taken the pedicle on one side or part of the pedicle on one side. Uh, and often that's necessary just to get enough room. So if, if you had taken the entire pedicle and you were just left with just a vertebral body screw, uh, I would say, what's the harm in going one more level uh, below to get a fusion uh, that's a little bit more robust, but I don't think uh, obviously that's gonna be necessary in every case. Uh, I think this is a great approach just because it was already an ipsilateral uh, disc herniation to that side. So by taking that pedicle down, you'd be uh, right on the disc and you wouldn't have to really manipulate the cord. Um, and lastly, I think the, the fact that we didn't see any calcification uh, or any ossification of that disc. Uh, so the, the worry or the concern about it being adherent to the underlying dura wasn't there. So I think the operative plan was very solid going in. Um, I love this approach. I've actually utilized it uh, maybe uh, more now than I have in the past. So I, I did a lot of transthoracic decompressions in the past, but this is obviously off to the side. I think this is exactly what that uh, uh, transpedicular approach is meant to do. How do you guys feel about, about fusions? Because you know some people say you don't need to fuse at all. Other people say use a structural graft. I was interested to see he used a non-structural graft, but it looked like on the CT scan they actually got a fusion out of it. Um, but uh, you know there are people who argue uh, uh, multiple sides of the coin. Um, do you always fuse or do you, you try to do a more uh, solid fusion, a rigid fusion than this, or you think it doesn't matter? Either or both. <laughs> I guess I mean, I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll but, take a shot here. Um, I, I have for very acute looking thoracic discs where they really just look like they're soft. They have a, a history. This just happened three, four days ago. Uh, and it looks like there's kind of that lighter T2 signal uh, in the disc itself. I have done tubular cases where I just take down the medial half of the facet and, and not fuse them. Uh, I think that's really rare. I can probably count that on, on one hand, how many times I've done that. And I'll do a tubular case and, and they do well. If there's any degree of uh, uh, chronicity to the disc herniation, if it looks dark on T2 uh, uh, images like this one did, I think it's probably gonna be more substantial. I'd be worried that you'd have to manipulate the cord inadvertently doing that. So I like the, the idea of just taking out a lot of bone really pulling it away from the cord with no chance of putting pressure on it. And I think if you're gonna take the facet, I've seen a couple of cases where people have gone on to develop instability in the thoracic spine. It's just harder to deal with later. And I think the downside of fusing is so low in the thoracic spine, especially over one or two segments. So my preference is probably fuse most of them, so. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, that'd be my preference as well. Um, in part because, you know, I, I generally do try to um, get, as Ahmed said, suggested, kind of as much wide exposure as I can before I start trying to take that disc out. And that almost always involves um, taking out the facet uh, and usually a good portion of the pedicle. I was actually, one of the reasons why I thought this was an interesting case is because I've, you know, always taken the whole pedicle. I've never actually seen anyone um, sort of take it as described, just that superior aspect and then try to put a screw through that um, distal aspect. Um, I've never, uh, uh, tried decompressing alone in this setting. Um, I know obviously that's been described and described with good success, uh, because of, um, the rigidity of the thoracic spine, but like, uh, Dr. Nasser alluded to, I think there's such little morbidity for short segment fusions in the thoracic spine that, 
Um, for me, that's just a safer approach. Thank you. Good discussion. I'm just curious, Dr. Blumenthal, uh, Dr. Uh, Ziegler, uh, Dr. Geyer, I mean, what would your opinion be on this case? Would you have taken that same approach? Well, no, since none of the three of us do uh, thoracic disc herniations anymore, we can just kind of report what the guys in our group do. And it's very consistent with what you showed. And, you know, Mike, I was going to follow up on the same, I was going to ask basically the same question as Jack is, is if there any literature on doing transpedicular thoracic discectomies alone without fusion with the inherent stability of the rib cage, but you've kind of already answered that. So thanks. I know, you know, we're, we're classically old man trained to do transthoracic uh, decompression. So, you know, you usually took so much bone that you had to do a fusion. But I know when John Regan started doing vats, you know, on thoracic discs, he often would not fuse. And, you know, we kind of looked at him cockeyed. But, uh, you know, you're right. The intrinsic stability of the, the rib cage in general, especially with a, um, a partial um, decompression, not taking the whole disc, disc out, um, seemed to have reasonably good results. You know, yeah, I was going to say, so, so I did one of these uh, two weeks ago, and I did exactly the same thing, except for I did instrument the level below. So very similar to what you guys are talking about. Mike, nice background. Did you do it in your this car? This is in the parking lot at the Stars game. Say, did you operate in your car? <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, I got my, my jersey. I'm ready to go. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, uh, segue hopefully to our next case here. Um, which is a little bit different, but again, kind of keeping in vain with, uh, you know, thoracic myelopathy cases this is actually one of my own patients. Um, so this was a, a 59 year old male who um, presented with progressive loss of ambulatory capacity. He presented to me actually in a motorized scooter uh, from uh, out of state and he'd had actually multiple uh, knee and hip replacements and procedures locally for treatment of this loss of ambulatory capacity. He had no pain and what made him seek out care was he began developing um, incontinence. Uh, he had pretty severe weakness throughout his lower extremities. And again, really, you know, when I'd seen him was uh, non-ambulatory at that point. Um, you can see from his uh, imaging, including uh, this MRI scan, uh, that he has severe uh, stenosis at the T10-11 level, as well as at T9-10. And if we kind of Go to a CT scan, you can see he's got a fairly sort of ankylose type spine and he has, um, you know, ossification of the ligamentum flavum. So you can see that um, uh, appearance there on the uh, trans, uh, the axial CT scan. Uh, and so we had a long discussion with him, especially regarding prognosis with his pretty significant um, weakness uh, and elected to proceed uh, with the decompression and fusion. Um, and this was actually the first case of, of um, OLF that I had done and, you know, it was quite challenging. Uh, and one of the things that was particularly challenging was getting a plane underneath that uh, ligamentum. And I just kept sort of having to drill out pretty lateral to kind of finally find a plane that was safe. Uh, but he did get some neurologic function back. So I saw him back for two years, actually not too long ago. And, you know, he can now ambulate with um, sort of uh, walking sticks in both hands um, for short distances and overall is pretty pleased with his result. I just wish we could have gotten to him sooner. Uh, these are his uh, post-op x-rays. So I did elect to fuse him in this case. You know, I did present this case um, uh, at our spine conference here at Mayo. And, and certainly there was some discussion in the setting of his uh, fairly ankylos spine, whether that was necessary. Um, you know, I think Again, for me, having drilled out a fair amount of the facet and, and feeling a little bit more comfortable about not having to worry about him developing kyphosis over time, I elected to fuse, but certainly I think that would be a very interesting discussion point there. Um, and I thought it'd be a great way to segue into uh, talking a little bit about OPLL and the thoracic spine and OLF, because it's not something that we see a lot, um, especially in our population here. It's well described as we all know, in the Japanese literature, it's actually an ossification. So it is indeed um, bone formation 
uh, of the ligamentum and actually gets replaced with fibrocartilaginous um, cells, which die and get uh, vascularized and, and ossified. And we know that the incidence is probably, you know, two to four times higher in Japan and, and Asia, Southeast Asia than the United States. Um, and a lot of times it's associated, especially in the thoracic spine with myelopathy. And you can see there's several different types. Uh, we talked a little bit when we did our journal club a few uh, months ago now um, about um, a couple of concepts, particularly occupation ratio, um, basically measuring the amount of the spinal canal that these lesions can occupy. And we know that patients who have greater than 60% uh, occupation risk are um, at a higher risk for uh, progressive myelopathy uh, and uh, are um, not well treated with a posterior alone decompression. And, you know, CT scan can be very helpful and we know that it can coexist both in the cervical and thoracic spine. With regards to OLF, which is kind of unique to this case, it's even a little bit more rare and uncommon. Again, more common in patients of East Asian descent. Um, and we know that, you know, in patients with OLF, you know, there's a bunch of surgical options, including decompression, fusion. There's been some descriptions in the Japanese uh, literature of doing uh, thoracic laminoplasty. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as I think um, maybe some of the more senior uh, experts here might allude to, I think there's a high rate of uh, risk of CSF leak in this case, probably somewhere around uh, 20% and risk of uh, uh, post-operative neurologic deficits because there's can be uh, often ossification of the dura in these cases. Um, so again, a little bit different case, uh, but um, we also kind of had mentioned this in our journal club, again, techniques to try to address um, OPLL and OLF. Uh, this is a great example of a way to address OPLL from a posterior only approach, uh, doing bilateral uh, pedicle and, and costotracysectomies. Uh, and essentially creating room underneath the OPLL so that it can kind of float off of the cord anteriorly. Uh, and these are some sort of good example pictures of what a decompression looks like uh, um, uh, pre and post optic myelograms, again, showing the technique. Um, you know, again, in rare cases, you can actually see the two uh, pathologies occur together. So there are descriptions of OPLL and OLF occurring together. Uh, this was the largest series that I could find of 15 patients. Uh, and again, um, you can see here very challenging cases to manage, a 13% uh, incidence of neurologic deficits postoperatively. Um, so definitely something that, um, you know, should have your antenna up when you're approaching these types of cases. So with that, I'll kind of open it up to the panel. Um, Dr. Nasser, uh, any um tips, tricks, recommendations uh, for how to approach these types of cases? Uh, I think it's a great, uh, a great uh, conversation. I, the very first patient I remember having to take care of OLF or ossified uh, ligamentum flavum, I think I was in my first or second year of practice and the, it was a Hmong patient, so a patient uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, came in with profound myelopathy and um, I, I did the decompression went as lateral as I could and lifted up and I was just looking at the spinal cord and I was not looking at any dura. There were no dural edges that were remaining on the lamina and there was really just no dura out to the nerve roots. And so I was looking at the spinal cord and all these exposed roots. And I said, well, how do I even sew? The only thing that's left is ventral dura. And so I called in one of my neurosurgery colleagues and I said, can you take a peek in here? And he's like, just close it up real tight. It'll be fine. And sure enough, some of the larger dural tears that we have or, or dural uh, deficiencies in this case actually present some of the less uh, challenging problems. I, so I layered some duragen and, and closed. But I, I think the, the teaching point for me was when I see these cases, I do get a little bit uh, nervous in that, what am I going to do for dural reconstruction? Am I going to put in a diverting lumbar drain? You know, what am I going to do if I run into an, an absence of dura in such a large area that I just don't really have any native dura to sew to? Um, and uh, sure enough, that gentleman did great. He discharged on post-op day two. It just it blew my mind away. And he was just so happy and his neurologic function improved. Um, I think one of the challenges and maybe why they actually do a little bit poorer than some of the other things that we see is that posterior column dysfunction is also a really challenging thing to recover from. So they can actually recover motor strength, uh, but then they still don't walk very well because their, their posterior columns are affected. So they lose their proprioception. 
Um, and they actually have really profound deficits that are not motor deficits. It's just, I don't know where my leg is in, in space. And so they don't generally walk that well. Um, so again, challenging case. I think you did a great job. Uh, it's probably exactly what I would have done. And my gentleman, he also had DISH uh, and I elected not to fuse him, that first patient that I mentioned. I've had subsequent patients though that weren't as convincing that they were fused. Uh, and I've just gone ahead and fused them simultaneously. I think, again, I think that, that I err on the side of it's probably not that morbid to put screws in if you've already done that kind of a decompression, so. Did you say that in your case, Ahmed, that you did not put a graft in, you just closed them primarily as a neurosurgeon told you? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the truth was, and I really do mean this, there was no, no dura even around the nerve roots. If I sacrificed the roots, uh, we talked about that option and just looking at his ventral dura, his ventral dura was actually quite adherent to the underlying bone. And so we couldn't get a margin to, that would actually allow a stitch. Uh, and, and the cord was completely decompressed. So I laid some Duragen uh, just right on top of the cord. And then I closed several muscle layers. Then I closed the fascia. I kept the guy down for a couple of days uh, and let him uh, start trying to mobilize on post-op day two and just really looked for a wound problem. Cause my thought was he's going to leak CSF from his wound uh, and um, uh, no leakage from his wound, no headache. The guy woke up and just did amazingly well. He only saw me uh, at his uh, three or four month post-op visit. Uh, and then he kind of disappeared and he was, he was from out of town, but on that visit, his neuro exam was normal. He was rating his pain like one out of 10, not taking any medications. And I just kept on inquiring, you know, did you ever have any headache after surgery? <laughs> no doctor. And this is obviously with a translator. Uh, he, and, uh, and, uh, but just amazingly tough individual. And it was just the most profound loss of Dura I've ever seen. And yet this guy had zero CSF symptoms. So he probably had a stable pseudomeningocele. I bet you if we had MRI'd him, he'd have a nice little uh, CSF pocket right underneath the muscles. Uh, and I'm sure it would be tough to revise if, if somebody had to go back in there, but uh, fortunately he did well. That's great. You know, it's similar pathobiology to, to the OPLL. It's a very slow inflammatory process. And the nightmare of trying to do anterior decompression of OPLL is you just don't have room to work. Um, you can't even attempt to try repairing if the dura is so adherent or even becomes part of the ossific mass. Um, at least dorsally, you know, you can, you have an extensile exposure, but as you said, you're looking at a big defect, but uh, you know, we must have some neurosurgeons uh, listening in, but I've had that advice also that it's the pinholes that uh, high pressure leaks that give you trouble at the larger defects. If you just close the fascia um, in a watertight manner, most of the time they will stabilize them just as you found, although God only knows what the MRI looks like uh, now, if you if you want fishing for something. And I'll add that there are other cases that I've had where I've just put in a diverting drain as well. And I think that's very low morbidity. And it's another way of just making yourself feel like you're taking that, you know, drainage and putting it somewhere else. But I just thought that there was almost no point because it was such a large defect. It's kind of like a cranial defect where they, you know, they just close skin sometimes over uh, the brain matter on occasion. And, and I've, I've talked to my plastic surgeons about this as well in terms of Dural reconstruction when they've radiated a, a you know a skull, and they've taken out a tumor including skin and dura, and sometimes they don't primarily reconstruct the dura, and it's it's pretty impressive that they can uh, do that as a, in the neurosurgical field as well. Although obviously not my area of expertise. So, quick question because I think some of the participants might be interested. You obviously mentioned the low morbidity these days of thoracic pedicle screws. Are you using navigation, and if so, which which navigation systems do you use? Um, I, I personally, uh, don't, um, I, I usually just, uh, I get a preoperative CT scan though. Uh, and as any of my fellows or residents could attest to, I'm pretty anal about measuring interparticular distance, measuring screw diameters. Um, and so I have a pretty, um, you know, pretty robust preoperative plan, which I think helps me. Um, but, uh, some of our, our, um, colleagues do. And, and if so, I think they, we have O-arm and stealth available to us more recently. We did, um, uh, purchase seven D which is sort of coming online right now. Great. Thanks. Well, that's uh, a good discussion. Unfortunately of a uh, CSF leaks, which is something that hopefully everybody will face at some point, but, um, 
one of the other points that I think um, some of our neurosurgical colleagues have told me is um, placing uh, sub superfascial drains. So fat drains right above the fascia and an incisional wound vac to try to get that skin to heal really quickly um, so that you hopefully avoid, um, you know, a, a cutaneous issue. Um, so with that, I'll kind of jump into the next case here. Um, this is um, uh, sort of a different uh, type of pathology, but still um, important to kind of think about for degenerative issues in the, um, sorry, my computer is giving me a problem here, uh, degenerative thoracic myelopathy. Excuse me, give me two seconds, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna jump into case three now. And this is an 84 year old female who I also took care of. Uh, so it's interesting presentation. So she had fallen in mid January, uh, just a ground level fall at her nursing facility or sorry, her assisted living facility. Um, and she was seen in our emergency department evaluated, found to have an L1, what was described as a compression fracture. She uh, was sort of stabilized and discharged uh, with a brace. Um, and starting um, over the next several days, she noticed progressive urinary retention issues uh, and mid back pain. Over time, this progressed to lower extremity weakness. And by the time she represented to the emergency department, it was about six weeks later, and she had fairly advanced weakness uh, in her lower extremities. And prior to this, she was, um, you know, a community ambulator at an assisted living facility. Um, she did associate with this have some urinary incontinence and was noted to have sort of an abnormal uh, rectal examination. Uh, these were her initial sort of presenting films uh, when she uh, was seen in the emergency department and placed into a brace. Um, and you can see she has this um, sort of senile burst fracture um, at uh, what we call L1, also could be T12, depending on your nomenclature. Uh, and you can see the stenosis there from the posterior wall fragment. Um, on subsequent imaging and workup on MRI, she was found to have um, uh, you know, fairly advanced stenosis at that uh, level. Uh, and you can see here on um, some cross-sectional imaging that in addition to that, she was found to have this epidural lipomatoma, lipoma, uh, which contributed to um, you know, additional stenosis at this level. And so now we're kind of looking at um, a fairly frail 84 year old female uh, with this senile burst type fracture and um, progressive uh, myelopathy type symptoms. Um, and so maybe before jumping into it, uh, what we ended up doing, maybe I'll stop here and just get any thoughts from the panel on, on the management of, of these types of injuries. Great cases, Arjun. This is Jens Chavin from Seattle. So uh, really compelling uh, stuff and nice work. When I see, when I hear presentations about geriatric patients, for me, the first question always goes to their mental status and their uh, mental capabilities. Secondly, their psychosocial setting. So before we go into any bone densities or the profile of the spine or whatever, their neurocognitive uh, skill set is probably my first and foremost concern. So maybe we can start there. Yeah, and so luckily this patient's actually pretty um, otherwise cognitively sharp. Uh, she does live in an assisted living facility that has a family that's um, you know close by and does help her uh, with you know certain things. Um, prior to this, again, she you know ambulated around her facility just fine. Um, you know, got her own groceries, that sort of thing. You know, she wasn't running marathons, but but a pretty reasonably active person for her age. Um, sure. What's her ROI like? What's her bone density like on the CT uh, uh, sampling of Hounsfield units? So I, I can't say I have the Hounsfield units on my hand uh, on hand, but I can tell you her her T score was minus three point seven. So very very low. And so uh, I, I don't know. I'd be curious again to hear what the panel thought before I share what we did. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what the panel would uh, do in this situation. Um, would anyone elect to just sort of um, treat this conservatively and, and watch? Would someone, uh, would people like to operate? I wanna make a quick comment to Jens's comment. Um, you know, we're in Dallas, Fort Worth, which is a pretty big metropolitan area. And I tried to get 
this quantitative CT with Hounsfield units and was told by our radiologist that they don't do that anymore. Wow. Which I was very surprised. Well, well Scott, actually one of our fellows showed me a way to measure it actually off the, yeah. uh, off our PAC system, at least when our PAC system was working. When it was working, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when it was working. Well, <laughs> you'll, 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 take you'll have to show me that. You can take a region of interest and actually um, uh, measure pretty routinely off of PAC. So that's something that it might not be done automatically with the CT, but uh, usually uh, with the PAC unit, you can actually uh, you know, just measure it as a unit of interest or a re region of interest. You know, I, I think Yen's point uh, was very important about the cognitive function of the patient and certainly uh, the risk of perioperative cognitive delirium. We showed that that's a major risk factor in complex reconstructions for infection, uh, as well as prolonged length of stay. This is a tough case, uh, Arjun, and, but not an uncommon case, and perhaps something that's becoming increasingly common. And in this instance, uh, I mean, it sounds like she's got a significant coma injury. She's uh, lost her, her urinary continence and um, um, perhaps got a significant conus injury from what you're describing. And uh, I, I think this is something that I, I, I would move forward with with surgery. And, you know, in terms of what to do, I'd, I'd augment the screws two above and two below. And, and a VCR is not a big operation here. And what I mean by that is that in a patient with severe osteoporosis, in a way, the, the two easiest VCRs to do are the patient who's got a, who's already had a kyphoplasty or a vertebroplasty because taking out that cement's pretty easy to do, or the patient who's uh, you know really got this this severe degree of osteoporosis. The key to it is to actually take out the disc above and below. If you take out the disc above and below, and really do a meticulous job on those end plates uh, and stay away from the bone early on, then then uh, actually taking out the corpus uh, uh, can, can can happen very quickly. And this tends to be. Uh, in, in this sort of a vertebral plana, it doesn't tend to be terribly vascular. So, uh, d you know, doing a VCR is, is not a big operation, as, as I'm sure you're going to show us, it's not a big operation here. And then the other key about a VCR is trying to really shorten the sp spinal column, but that's another conversation. But if you're going to do surgery, um, the idea of doing something smaller than a VCR doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because this is kind of the easiest VCR you can get. But we'll see what you did. Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll I'll jump to that now. I have one more <clears throat> second. I have one more suggestion to make. What I found very helpful in these elderly patients <clears throat> is if they're even thinking about surgery to get a palliative medicine consult. We pretty routinely get that nowadays, and it's uh, not being fatalistic or nihilistic. I actually totally agree with Sig Bourbon, but I feel that this leads to a very healthy discussion. And it covers me also about end of life uh, thoughts by the patient, how far do they want to go, what do they want to go. And I found more often than not, by far more often than not, that patients and their families have not had these discussions, surprisingly. So that's my one little thing that I'd like to add to six otherwise excellent discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Tabman. I think that's a good point. I actually did have a sort of a round table meeting with her and her family kind of just discuss what our goals of care were. And, and again, after kind of discussing everything, they did wish to proceed with surgery. Um, so that's uh, <clears throat> exactly what we did. Um, you can see here, we ended up going three up, three down, um, doing a vertebrectomy there uh, at uh, L1, uh, as we're calling it. Um, I didn't end up sacrificing the roots here uh, and just tried to kind of um, sneak this cage in around them. Uh, and then, you know, because I was so concerned, she really had such poor bone quality. I literally, we were cannulating the pedicles with my ball tip feeler. Um, we ended up, you know, putting some structural graft down and then I actually sent her, uh, on post-op day one or two for, um, cement augmentation to try to get some, at least some, you know, additional stability to the construct. But you can see here on her first standing films that that cage has already subsided you know, down to the level of those distal screws. Um, thankfully, she's done really well from a neurologic standpoint. So you can see there's a post-op CT scan, um, you know, showing our decompression there and resection of that posterior wall fragment. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I didn't find a whole lot of literature on this, but when I kind of looked it up, there was an interesting paper out of Japan, uh, kind of looking at a series of about 50 patients with this very problem. Uh, and they kind of looked at, you know, anterior posterior approaches, didn't really find a huge difference. Uh, but as you can see here, you know, about 60 to 70% of patients 
did have neurologic uh, improvement uh, and improvement in alignment. So I think you know that's the one positive takeaway from this. Um, but with that, I'd kind of open up any thoughts on cement augmentation uh, or uh, either intraoperatively or postoperatively from the group. Vince Arlay had a, a comment in the chat line. Vince, are you uh, able to talk to us? I'm not sure he's hooked up, but his suggestion was uh, cemented screws, one above, one below, and then um, vertebroplasty uh, at the next levels, proximal and distal, and just limit the, the length of the fixation. Yeah, I think that's what I would have uh, suggested. I think what I heard uh, uh, six day as well. I think that two above, two below would have been my thing and a UIV plus one, UIV minus one cementing and a UIV uh, and LIV cement augmentation at the time of screw fixation. Nowadays with our cannulated perforated screws by, I would have chosen one of those implant systems and put like one or two CCs in there and obviously no bracing. <clears throat> the one question I have for you, Arjun, is um, uh, if you now have larger cages available, uh, or for instance, uh, through far lateral procedures, these very large footprint cages uh, through a separate procedure after kind of preparing the patient, would that be something you'd consider? Yeah, and I, and I thought about that too. Um, to be honest, you know, that, that's what I was weighing here. And that's why I think it's an interesting case um, is, you know, the added morbidity of another approach to try to get a larger footprint cage versus um, maybe uh, a little bit less morbidity from coming from a single approach. But, you know, because of that, I did add, um, you know, uh, maybe a couple of extra levels of fixation that maybe could have been avoided with a, a larger cage footprint. Uh, I'm online now. Can you hear me? It's uh, Vincent. Uh, yes. So I, I've changed completely uh, uh, the way I treat osteoporotic uh, patients now. I used to do a long fixation because I thought nothing would, would hold anymore. And then I do, I, I do that as short as possible with a cement on my screws and cement above and below, of course, a minectomy. And then I go in the front as well. I put the large footprint cages and I put a fixation again in the front. So remaining very short, um, which I think just decreased the, the adjacent problem. Make a very strong fixation, very short in, in, the, in the back and the front and cement the UIV uh, plus one and the LIV plus one distally and, and stay very short. Uh, I find this it's, uh, allows us to have the uh, junctional problem uh, that we often see in osteoporotic patients. I'll just add uh, one comment, uh, Arjun. I think, I mean, technically you did a great job. I, I think <clears throat> some of the challenges with cement and I, I learned this from one of my senior partners is that it, you know even if you have a great fluoroscopy unit, even if you're being incredibly meticulous with your cement technique, these older patients with this incredibly osteoporotic bone, that cement can still end up in the lung. They can still have kind of this uh, vascular phenomena that happens where they drop their pressure, just like when we cement a femur uh, in, in orthopedics, uh, where they can have that you know drop in their pressure when the cement is curing. Um, and we've had some on-table deaths with cement augmentation, even with no visualized extravasation of cement. So meaning the fluoro looks beautiful. There doesn't seem to be a vein that's filling. Um, and yet you get an MR, you know, you post uh, the postmortem is uh, a cement uh, pulmonary embolism, right? Uh, and so, you know, I think the challenges with these patients are when you have a T-score of minus 3.7, uh, it may be very well be that we're getting close to end of life because it's hard to support your skeleton once you get to a certain degree of osteoporosis. Um, and so it's challenging. You know, you see somebody that's highly functional. I think I would be more inclined to want to intervene just like you did. Uh, but then again, I think you have to have real conversations with them about the possibility of, you know, expiring on the table. When we looked kind of ad hoc at our own patients and looked at the events where we had deaths or major complications or cement extravasation, it tended to be higher in the patients where we had them on table and were cementing uh, versus the patients that we closed, then sent to radiology on a separate day after they've recovered a bit and then cemented them. And so my practice has shifted significantly from, you know, intraoperative cement. And then the last thing I'll say is instead of cages in, in some patients, I'll actually cement 
or put a big ball of cement in the front if I don't think they're ever going to heal. So kind of treating them like a tumor or cement in the cage. Uh, it's not something that's really sexy. It looks really horrible. You got this big ball of cement in the front, but it is increasing the surface area a little bit in the front as well. So just my thoughts. If I can add a couple thoughts to this, uh, I've migrated now to doing a lot more of these cases posteriorly first, particularly with the neurological deficits. So I'll instrument them. I'll cement all the screws. I will cement the upper instrumented plus one, get them decompressed, and then watch them for a couple days and see what their recovery is like and then decide what else do I need to do to augment the anterior column. And we've got a whole menu of things that you've heard of, and every one of those things can be done either through a lateral approach, a direct anterior approach, a thoracal lumbar, whatever it, it may be, or even a percutaneous type approach just to fill it up with cement. So doing them from behind first, I think, buys you a little bit of time and will let you know what their neurologic recovery may be like before you put them through the complete front back. In, in terms of cementing, since that's the topic here, I wonder um, if, if somebody could comment on the idea of cementing the UIV, I certainly understand. The UIV plus one are basically cementing above and below that. One of the troubles I've seen with that is osteonecrosis of the end plates and actually some pretty advanced and rapid degeneration of the adjacent segments. And so, so my preference in general at the top of a long construct uh, from Thraca lumbar junction is I'll cement the UIV, but, but I'm, I'm not convinced that cementing the UIV plus one really helps much because it, when, when we see PJK, the fracture tends to be at the UIV rather than the UIV plus one. But I wonder, I wonder if anybody uh, can, can, can uh, explain to me why, why the UIV plus one is, uh, is often cemented. I, <clears throat> I've seen the UIV plus one with inferior end plate collapse quite often. So that's what I am trying to avoid with that. Uh, I agree there is an issue with osteonecrosis of the bone, but I do think that's more of an age-related issue, meaning that the octogenarians plus, I haven't seen that in, but the 50-year-old osteoporotic uh, I have seen that accelerated degeneration. And I think it's got something to do with their bone metabolism and their age. They may still have some remodeling machinery that um, goes into overdrive when we choke off the blood supply by doing the vertebral augmentation. So I just don't think we know the answer to that. Uh, Izzy, don't you think it's related to the amount of the cement we put in the vertebral body? It's like we just only put... Uh a couple of cc, uh, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, if you just feel the vertebral uh, body as much as possible, it may happen. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I've, I tend to fill as close as I can end plate to end plate on, on these. Um, now, I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer. I've certainly had my share of PJK with uh, cement augmentation of the upper instrumental level plus one. So I still don't know. Yeah. Sorry. So were you going to say something? Oh, just classically that that that's the biomechanical st uh, study uh, that Kabesh did was done with the UIV plus one cemented, but but again I, I'm I'm not convinced that it's the right thing to do. Perhaps especially in, in younger patients. Perhaps especially then. All great discussion. Thanks to everyone uh, for, for weighing in on that. Because again, that's something that uh, I think, you know, as we've alluded to, there's not clear guidance uh, for this. So some of this is really um, uh, taking everyone's experience into account. Um, going to our next case. Um, so this is, a, an, again, another case of a patient with um, obviously symptoms of thoracic myelopathy, urinary retention. This is a younger patient. Um, you can see here on this imaging, again, this um, evidence of a thoracic central disc uh, and stenosis with cord signal change at T11-12. Uh, and you can see some calcification um, uh, of the disc itself at that level. 
Uh, and I'm kind of jumping through this one. We um, elected to perform uh, decompression, transpedicular uh, decompression and fusion with an inner body cage. Uh, and the reason I'm presenting is because I actually uh, did utilize intraoperative ultrasound in this case, um, which it was really helpful, uh, at least for me, um, because it allowed me to maybe do a little bit less because I was sort of um, able to stop with my discectomy and resection. Uh, and I didn't feel um, sort of compelled to do more bony resection because I was happy with the decompression. Uh, and really, I have to say that this is something that uh, I've learned from one of my uh, partners with a special interest in spinal oncology, Dr. Peter Rose, he's kind of the one who's shown me a little bit of this. And I think some of our neurosurgeons are a little bit more familiar with the use of ultrasound, uh, but I had to definitely go and read about it. And um, I think this is a great paper kind of describing, uh, you know, what the cord looks like on ultrasound and how this compares to what we're used to seeing on MRI uh, and how you go about getting good axial and sagittal cuts with the ultrasound intraoperatively. And you can see here how the authors used it to assess their decompression and guide their decompression intraoperatively. And so I was hoping maybe to get some weigh in from the panelists um, on the use of ultra intraoperative ultrasound, uh, whether anyone's doing it, and uh, if so, any pearls or techniques that they'd recommend. So similar to you, Arjun, I learned this uh... Uh, coming to Mayo, uh, I learned it from one of my neurosurgery colleagues for a traumatic thoracic disc uh, right at the cervical thoracic junction. And it's an area where you don't want to manipulate the cord and, and really seeing through the cord is just an amazing uh, uh, um, resource to have at your disposal, just in case you can't see what you're doing exactly. You're working in front of the cord uh, and you want to assess the adequacy of the decompression. And I actually literally just used this a few weeks ago for a thoracic disc as well. Um, and, uh, I think some of the cool features of this are that it really does show you a lot better anatomy than you would ever think an ultrasound would do, uh, especially given the fact that, you know, once you've done your decompression, you can really uh, have some beautiful images of the cord. You can see the cord uh, pulsating. You can actually turn on the Doppler flow and you can actually see the anterior spinal artery. And sometimes you can even see the posterior spinal arteries, uh, perfusing the cord on the axials. Uh, so it's just a very cool, uh, technique. And I think it's uh, very helpful for seeing that ventral portion of the canal. Uh, great case. I mean, how big is the probe itself? The tip? How many millimeters? So, so there are different probes. Uh, you can actually get a disposable probe that our neurosurgeons really like. And uh, it's about a centimeter and a half across at the tip. So it's a very, very small probe. So you can put it right over the uh, dura and if you were going crosswise, it would fit perfectly almost the size of a thoracic decompression. Uh, it may be a little bit too small to fit in, for example, a cervical corpectomy. Um, you, know, you know, you could potentially use it that way as well, uh, but more often you're using it from dorsal to ventral to look at ventral pathology. Uh, so if you've done a laminectomy, I think you're gonna have enough room to put that smaller probe in. Uh, that's a disposable probe. The reusable probes, it's closer to two centimeters uh, width, uh, for the smallest probe that we have. But, um, again, you can usually get a pretty good image. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has experience using it. And also have you ever used it in the lumbar spine for decompression, just to know if you got to decompress the canal enough rather than yeah. just keep going and going and going. You can, it, it looks beautiful, uh, in, in the lumbar spine. It's a little bit more confusing because it's not one singular structure that you're looking at, but you can actually see the outlines of the dural sac really nicely. So I've used it for uh, uh, you know, intradural disc herniations to make sure that I've actually gotten all of the intradural component to the disc herniation. Uh, and sometimes that'll occur in the thoracic spine, sometimes that'll occur in the lumbar spine. Uh, but if you're really looking for something that looks, you know, you're looking for the thing that doesn't look like the other. Uh, and so, uh, you know, disc material will look different than a nerve. You can use it in the, in the lumbar spine, but you get a little bit more confused as to what the roots are versus the dura. Uh, the, it, definitely at spinal cord level, it's a little bit easier to understand. And what company you can makes it? You can also bring in a, a radiologist on occasion. They'll, they'll do this for you. The radiologist, even if they're not a specialist in doing it for the cord, if you bring in an ultrasound uh, radiologist, you can have them scrub with you in the OR. And you can just tell them, this is what I'm looking for. Just don't push too hard down. 
they're really, they're experts at doing this because they, they do other, you know, uh, structures that are kind of uh, similar in consistency to the Dura when they're, when they're trying to ultrasound. And so uh, they're actually, they've got an amazingly light touch and they can actually give you all the different cuts that you want if it's really a critical thing where you have to know, am I doing this right or not? So they can give you beautiful images, if, especially if it's your first time uh, using it. That's cool. Jens, do you use that at all? Yeah, we, we have uh, the benefit of our neurosurgical uh, system is we have a lot of ultrasound and ultrasound expertise available and I've used it especially in the cervical cord. For the thoracic spine, I actually use something very different that's extrinsic. I use a 70 degree nasal endoscope with a video camera and I dry scope. So after getting good hemostasis, I can actually put the scope post a lot. We've, we've published that I think in Journal of Neurosurgery a couple of years ago for the transfacetal thoracic discectomy technique. But I just, uh, from one side, put a large nerve hook down from the other side put the 70 degree scope down and then very carefully uh, peel along the front of the dural sac. And uh, that's been my go-to technique and it's for me faster. And so uh, it's uh, anyways, uh, immediately available. So um, that's how many, millimeters, how, many, how many millimeters diameter is it? Uh, this is a standard uh, 3.5 millimeter, uh, 70 degree scope. So, but in the thoracic discectomy, I mean, basically you have, I put a distracted on the other side. I have, plenty of space to go through there. Cool. So. Great. Well, again, uh, a, a tool that I, I'm learning how to use a little bit more and, and certainly hopefully, um, you know, uh, has a lot of applications that we haven't even realized yet. Um, we'll jump to our last case here. Um, and uh, this is a 76 year old gentleman uh, with a thoracic disc and myelopathy who was treated with a posterior decompression fusion elsewhere. Uh, if I remember correctly from the details and, and I'd have Dr. Nasser weigh in as well, um, the patient actually had a, a neurologic change intraoperatively and I think they stopped the surgery short. Nonetheless, when he presented, he was having progressive and persistent myelopathy. Uh, and you can see here uh, the posterior instrumentation that's in place. Um, and a persistent uh, disc herniation in the setting of a posterior uh, laminectomy. You can see here that the disc is, is calcified uh, and ossified um, and, and concerning for an intradural disc herniation. Um, and uh, um, the plan was made to, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. The plan was made to proceed with a lateral uh, approach. So this was um, approached transthoracically uh, and resected similar to the discussion uh, about the technique for resecting um, trans thoracic uh, distal trans thoracic, which we had reviewing our golden paper a few months ago. Um, and one month post op, that's kind of why we're presenting it, the patient had some progressive headaches, nausea, and dyspnea. And he reports that this started pretty soon after his chest tube was pulled uh, after the um, thoracic surgery. And you can see here um, that he has this uh, small fluid leak and evidence of actually herniation of the cord through that uh, dural defect. Uh, and since we're kind of getting towards the end here, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead and show the um, revision of this, which involved uh, using it a mental flap um, and using it to kind of plug in that uh, uh, defect in the ventral dura. And you can see what that type of reconstruction looks like. Uh, and you can see how uh, this patient uh, over a year out from surgery with a contained um, uh, pseudomeningocele there, um, a cord that's well decompressed. Uh, and I'll kind of leave it open here. Uh, Dr. Nash, this is a case of yours, so I'd, I'd be happy to hear your inputs or thoughts on it. Yeah. So, you know, when people tell me to present my worst complication, this is the one that I present, you know, this gentleman had had two prior thoracic discectomies, the first, the second of which they had to abort as, as, as Arjun said, and I should have been smarter, but I think I was too young and uh, decided to do this from the front, knowing that it would probably be stuck. Um, but I had done others uh, like this and I thought, well, how bad could it be? Uh, I had one of my neurosurgical colleagues come and take a peek with me and they couldn't get any suturing primarily to close the dura. So we did a subarachnoid drain. We did all the right things, but the chest tube started communicating. We eventually got him to be able to discharge. 
but here's the, the kicker. The guy calls me about a month after surgery and he says, I'm going blind and I'm coughing up something that tastes metallic. And so he had collapsed his entire lung with CSF. And, um, and so this was after we had gotten him through the tough part and he was no longer, no longer having headaches, wanted to discharge. Uh, and so what I've learned from this is uh, I think I, I, I definitely respect the transthoracic approach a lot more. I, I realize that you don't need to get the whole disc out. I, I think if I did this again and I had to go through transthoracic, I may do like a floating approach uh, where I actually take out, you know, uh, the back half of the body and let that piece of bone float forward. Uh, this was a very successful reconstruction technique in that it, it kind of just walled off the spine from the chest. And so just, you know, it's, it's an option. Latissimus uh, muscle can do that as well. Uh, but you want something that's long, vascularized, can get into the chest. So the, the um, uh, plastic surgeons here uh, harvested omentum, made a small hole through the diaphragm, and were able to tunnel this into the uh, area of the uh, CSF leak to wall off the CSF leak from the rest of the chest, where we have negative pressure pulling that CSF out with every breath. Uh, so a very humbling case, um, and uh, it taught me a lot. And uh, I, I think it's responsible for most of my hair loss uh, early on, uh, as probably uh, several of my white hairs as well. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the guy did well. He was my patient for an additional seven or eight years before he died uh, from other causes. So. Yeah, I mean, certainly a tough case, um, Ahmed, and I think um, highlights kind of how challenging managing these types of pathologies can be. And certainly anytime I see a patient with thoracic myelopathy, you know, my hairs are a little bit raised because, um, you know, as we've kind of pointed out or hopefully illustrated today, I think there's a lot of potential uh, pitfalls with any of these uh, cases. Uh, any other thoughts from the panelists? I think we're getting kind of towards the end of our session here today. So th thank you, thank you both for sharing those cases. Those those are really, really challenging. And, and that last case, Ahmed, uh, certainly I, I empathize with uh, the the difficulty of a, uh, a communication between CSF and the and the uh, pleural space, a negative pleural space, and that has a beautiful reconstruction done to, to salvage that. I think uh, that's that's one of the reasons why, in in general, <clears throat> I think a posterior approach rather than a transthoracic tends to be my preference, I can, I can make a big board and do a partial core pectin from the back and, and push things away from the back and work, work around the cord without uh, reliably getting into that pleural space. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Sig. And actually, I, I would have normally, I think, done that. Uh, but this guy actually had just come to me seven months out from someone else's surgery where and they were actually a great surgeon that did that operation. But during the posterior approach, he lost all motors. Uh, and he woke up uh, paraparetic. He had some a little bit of function left in his legs. And over the course of about six, seven months, he regained that function. And, you know, thinking that I was going to be a superhero, I said, well, we can't go from the back again because we've already had two dural tears and, and, and loss of motors. Maybe we need to come and pull it out indirectly. But certainly if, um, if I could do this over, I may still consider doing it from the back and just going wider, taking out more of the body, maybe even floating it from the back. Yeah, I'll tell you what, one place there's, there's always room is, uh, is you could always just take out the pedicle from the back. And that's, you know, you, know, you could always get wider in the back. And that, that's one of the things, uh, I think uh, Rick said it earlier about it being extensile. And uh, um, I, I've got a very low threshold to take out the pedicle, at least on one side, completely. One of the things that I've found very valuable for a lot of these thoracic disc herniations uh, especially when you've got the ossified ligamentum and the ossified uh, posterior longitudinal ligament is using the ultrasonic technology that's out there now. Uh, the hooks and the uh, ultrasonic curettes now really minimize the soft tissue trauma and give you much more control. And if you place your suction in the right positioning, you're not working underwater. So... Think, think of using the ultrasonic technology when you're doing these. Well, these are uh, great cases, great discussions. And, uh, you know, you guys uh, gave us a really good educational hour. Uh, so on behalf of all of us, you know, thank you very much uh, for stepping in uh, in your fellows' uh, absence. <laughs> Did great. Yeah, these are terrific cases. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Good job. Good night, everybody. Have a